And so today's lesson is going to deal somewhat with fatherhood, although we're taking a passage from Scripture that does not specifically deal with fatherhood. So in many ways, it applies to all of us. <clears throat> but on this day, I want us to think about fathers, and I want to think about the role and the influence that spiritual men should have in leading and participating in their families. Now, you'll notice the theme for the day is the tape measure. And you'll see that more and more as the service goes on. But what I want us to notice as we think about the measure of a man is the importance of measurements and standards in this world. It's important for us to have standards that everybody follows. You go to the pharmacy and you get some medication. It needs to be a certain number of milligrams that's within each pill or within each shot or whatever it is that you take. You go to the gas station and gas is already expensive. And so by the time you pay for a gallon of gas, you want it to actually be a gallon of gasoline. And so you'll notice every pump has a little seal on it showing that it's been measured to show that that gas pump follows that standard. When you and I think about construction and you and I think about work, <coughs> which is done in different places, it's important that everybody understands what's an inch, what's a foot, what's a yard. When we think about sports, and as we watched basketball last night, and as we see different sports which are going on, baseball and football and all these other things, it's important that there are standards that both teams understand and that both teams follow. So every part of life has standards which you're to live up to, standards which you and I can depend on. Now, these standards even come to the aspect of Christianity. What must I do to be saved? God gives a standard to follow. We are to hear God's word, believe, repent, confess the name of Jesus before others, and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. That standard is the same here. That standard is the same in Africa, in Europe, in South America, the world over for centuries, going back 2,000 years. We see the standards of how we are to worship God. We see the standards of daily living. And we see the standards that Paul gives by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of what it means to be a Christian man. And especially what it means to be a Christian father within the home. And so it's three simple things which we'll look at, three simple aspects where we see the measure of what it means in order to be a man. Well, what does it mean to be the man of God? Let's go ahead and go to our next slide there. As you and I look at this, you see the measure of God, and you see that there are things that a man of God needs to get away from, to flee from, if you will. That word there, but flee, is the word fuge. And that's actually where we get our English word. It's transliterated into our language to mean to flee, to run away quickly. And so in a certain aspect, the standard of what a Christian man is, is what a Christian man does not do. Many years ago, I used to do a lot of short-term mission work throughout the Caribbean. And on the island of Antigua, the preacher there is named Albert Isaac, and he gave a story one time. It's one I've always remembered. Remember the first time I heard it, I thought, that's so strange to say in church. And here I am 10 years later, and I'm going to say it in church. But it's a story which is common in Jamaica and Haiti and all through there. And so it, it's common for them to say, but it may sound kind of strange to us. There was a man who was selling a house, and he's selling it at a cheaper price. And as a person came in, the guy said, well, I can't afford this. I can afford just a little less. And the guy said, listen, I will sell you the house and everything to it, except I want to keep one thing. Well, what was that one thing? He said, I want to be able to put a nail above the door, and that nail and whatever's on it belongs to me. The man looked up, and he looked at the house. The house seemed sturdy. The house seemed nice. The house seemed secured where it could survive any hurricane, which is a big deal down there. And he thought, a nail. What does a nail matter? No big deal. And so he paid the purchase price, bought the house, and he owned everything except that little nail. Things worked great. The man married. The man brought his wife home. The man began to raise his children. Everything was going well. Everything looked perfect throughout that home. 
Eventually, the man who sold the house ran into financial trouble, and he lost the house which he had bought in turn. And so he needed to have the house back. So he came back, and he asked to buy the house. And the man said, but no, my wife's here. My family's here. I'm very good-looking, if you will, in my community. I'm not about to sell you back the house. And the man said, I'll pay you double. And he said, no, I'm not going to sell the house back. And the man said, I own the nail. And so he got a dead pig, a dead hog, and he hung the hog on that nail. Well, you know what would happen. Day after day, things got worse. Day after day, there were more flies, there was more stench, and it got worse and worse and worse. And finally, the man came back and said, okay, I'll sell you the house. The man who had sold the house in the first place said, I'll only pay you half of what, you, of what I paid you before. And the man said, that's only a quarter of what you offered. And he said, well... I'm just going to take what it's worth. And so the man ended up losing everything because he had allowed that nail to be in his house. Now, strange Caribbean story there, right? But here is what the purpose of it is. Here is the lesson that comes with that. You and I oftentimes in our Christian life pretty much have everything together. You know, we're church-going people. You know, we maybe uh, have our morals at least outwardly looking right. But many of us keep that small nail somewhere in our house that does not belong to God. We compartmentalize and give to God everything but one little bit. It may not happen today, and it may not happen tomorrow. But eventually, Satan is going to come and hang rotting flesh upon that nail. And it will change the dynamic of our entire life. And it will change everything that there is about us. And that's why you and I have to fully, as men of God, give ourselves to the Lord. You can't have that secret compartment. You can't have that hidden nail that belongs to somebody and makes your life easier, makes your life more pleasant, because the time will come when you will pay back to God whatever it is that you withhold from him. And so we see this word fuego. And Paul is telling Timothy, you run away. Get away immediately from these things. And we see this word flee many times in Scripture. First and foremost, 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 18, flee fornication. Stay away from sexual sins. We're not just talking about the practice. We're talking about having it in our thoughts. We're talking about having it in our lives. We're talking about allowing it in any form that's there. You see, sin is always going to grow. And be sure your sin will find you out. And so the Christian man of God must flee, run away, get away from fornication. Secondly, we see the man of God, 1 Corinthians 10, 14, needs to flee idolatry. What is an idol? It's anything that comes between you and God. An idol can be a sports team. An idol can be the things that your children do. An idol can be work. An idol can be what you do for your leisure. Anything that stands between you and God, get away from it. Don't leave that nail there. Make sure that there is nothing that stands between you and God. Make sure there's nothing that stands between your children and God. Flee idolatry. The very context of the passage which was just read for us. 1 Corinthians 6, 6 through 10. Do not love money. The love of money is a root of many kinds of evil by which many people have pierced themselves through over and over. This thing we know, we came into this world without anything, and we're going to leave without anything. But with food and clothing, with these things, we shall be content. So we see there in verse 6 and 11, flee covetousness, flee money. Now, sometimes we may feel like we run away from money too much. I've got several kids in college, and man, that money runs away. But that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about that love of money. That idea of, hey, that's what's most important in life. That's what you will give anything for. That's where your mindset always is. 
To be a Christian man of God, you've got to put God first. This idea, 2 Timothy 2 and verse 22, flee youthful lust. These are the things which as young people sometimes we think are more important. Perhaps relationships. Perhaps abusing certain things as alcohol and drugs. Perhaps getting caught up so much in trying to start our career or perhaps being so worried about what everybody thinks about us that we do things that really do not define who we are. Flee youthful lust. As we think about the context here, going back to 1 Timothy 6, I want us to think sometimes about this idea of money and the idolatry of money. What we do, especially I think in this country, is we bracket ourselves. If you take us world over, we are the wealthiest of the wealthiest of people. A lot of us have cell phones in our pocket. And those cell phones are hundreds of dollars. Some of them are almost a thousand dollars. And not only do we have them in our pocket, but our kids have them in their pockets. Kids as young as 10 years old. You look at what we eat. You look at where we live. You look at the vacations we go on. You look at our consumption that we do. We're among the wealthiest people who have ever lived on this earth. But we're not around the poor people of the first century. We're not around the people who are poor in this world. We're around people who pretty much are the same as us. And so since we don't see huge wealth, and since we don't see huge poverty, we look at ourselves and compare ourselves to our neighbor and compare ourselves to somebody who's across the auditorium, and we think, man, I'm poor. I don't have as much as they do. My car's not as nice as theirs. My house is not as nice as theirs. My vacation's not as nice as theirs. What I have doesn't compare, and so we feel poor even though the Lord has blessed us greatly. The Bible talks about this. And the Bible reminds us not to compare ourselves to other people. The Bible tells us to compete against ourselves and to take care of ourselves and our family. Greed is a form of idolatry. You know it. Colossians chapter 3, looking there in verse 5, right? Avoid covetousness, Paul says, which is idolatry. How many of us get so jealous of what somebody else has? How many of us feel poor, even though God has blessed us greatly, and it causes us to not be the kind of person God has designed us to be? It's caused us not to have joy. Even though God has showered us with blessings, we lose joy Because we're afraid that somebody else is having more fun than us. We're afraid that somebody else is happier than we are. We're afraid that somebody else may have more than us. And it changes our character. And it changes our nature. We've got to recognize God has blessed us greatly. And God blesses those who flee from things that take us away from God. Get out of the situation. Put yourself in a situation where you can serve him first and foremost. Secondly, a man of God is measured not just by what he runs away from, but what he runs toward. So go to our next slide there. We'll notice that. As we think about this running or following after, the word here used in that is this idea of not that you go and get it like you would run to Walmart and pick up some apples. It's a lifelong pursuit. You may be a person who has love, but you can grow in your love. You may be a person who has righteousness, but you can continue in your righteousness to improve, to grow stronger. I used to talk about raising children and such and talk about how God makes it where when you're raising a child, it starts a little bit easier and it gets more difficult. I remember my oldest, when he came home, um, I would take care of him many times. and Well, all the time, I guess. But, you know, I'd be taking care of him, and it was fairly easy. The guy just, you know, he would eat, he'd go to the restroom, he would sleep, and he would cry. That was was the role. 
And so when I was keeping him, I could just, you know, stick him on his, stick him on the bed or stick him on the uh, floor or whatever and just be there. And I remember one day, he was about eight, nine months old. He rolled away under a table. And I turned around and looked and said, he's gone. And from that day on, he was always moving. And the difficulty level just grew because he would start crawling. And as soon as I got used to that, he started running. As soon as I got used to that, he started talking. And I was like, oh, my goodness. And then, you know, they grow up all the way up into their 20s. And as they grow, the difficulty level changes. You have to learn as they grow how to handle those situations. It's the same way with these things. What is it that a man of God pursues? Righteousness. What's righteousness? It's a legal term, actually. But really what it means is to conform to God's standards. It means to be found righteous or right in the eyes of God. 1 John 3, 7, those who do not practice righteousness, they're under the control of the devil. You have to be under the control of God. Now, Many years ago, a man named Sweetness, Walter Payton, was running, you know, he was the greatest running back, one of the greater running backs, uh, you know, for the Chicago Bears. And I remember one time he was running, and one of the guys said, you know, if you add up all the yards that he's run, he's run nine miles. The guy ran a lot. He was a great running back. But the other guy responded back, and he said, but what's amazing is he runs nine miles by going four yards and getting walloped. And then he gets up and runs four yards again and gets walloped. When you pursue righteousness, that doesn't mean that the Christian life is easy and it's simple. It means every time you get walloped, you get right back up. And the next play, you run just as hard again. And then the next play, you run just as hard again. Christian man of God is not perfect. But he's constantly trying to follow God's rules and God's way and God's life. That's what it's about. Godliness, what is that? It's a respect for God. It's, a, it's, a, it's an effort to look like God, to act like God. It's a self-discipline which is there. Men cannot truly be what God has planned for them until they learn self-discipline. How to control yourself and how to act. This idea of faith, what's faith? It's trusting God. It's not thinking that you can fix every problem yourself, but it's putting God in your first in your life, following God and knowing that he will win the battle. When you're David, you have faith because you know that God will kill Goliath. It may be you slinging those stones, but it's God who wins the victory. Each day, a Christian man needs to grow in faith and trust in God's plan. Love, word thrown around a bunch, this is agapeo. This means the unnatural love. Loving other people more than you love yourself. Maybe you remember growing up, more so I think in generations past, where the father would get up and go and work, and he would work his hands down to a nub. He would get up before everybody else, go to the plant, go to the factory, go to the farm, go to the field. And he would work and work and work to provide for his family. It was a tough life 100 years ago. It was a tough life for many people 50 years ago. Why did our fathers do that? Love. They wanted to provide for other people. They wanted to fulfill their role. They wanted to show love to other people. And so that idea of love is putting other people before yourself. This aspect of patience. Really, as a King James, it should be perseverance. It's an endurance, which men should have. It's this idea of enduring difficult circumstances and making it through for the good of yourself and your family. This idea of meekness. Or gentleness. And the word actually comes from Alexander the Great horse. It was a white steed. He was always famous as he would go around in the battlefield in his white horse. The white horse was muscular. And yet it always was perfectly responsive to whatever the general would tell it to do. That word has been brought to our word today talking about this idea of meekness. Men are powerful. 
But they've got to be in control. They've got to do the things that God would have them to do. Now, a man of God not only runs away from things, not only follows after things, but a man of God is willing to fight. Now, we don't usually talk about that in church very much, do we? But you'll read in the Bible, men of God, fight. Notice some of these translations or passages. 1 Timothy 1.18, Timothy, you fight the good warfare. Jude 3, contend earnestly for the faith which was once and for all delivered to the saints. Zechariah 10, verse 5, you fight as mighty men of God. 2, Timothy, or 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5, our weapons are not carnal, but they're spiritual, able to tear down strong fortresses. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 10, fight the good fight, right? For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the forces of darkness in this world. Now that's different than what you hear in our culture, isn't it? In our culture, you hear that men and women are exactly the same. Really, they just change shoes, more or less. They dress however they want to dress. You just pick what you want to be that week. As you and I read in our Bibles, you see that men have a role. And especially fathers and husbands have a role. You're not the birth giver, as is funny a little bit with politics of nowadays. You're the person who leads your family in following after God. You're the person who fights and protects your family from the evil forces of this world. You're the person who sacrifices yourself for your spouse, for your children, to make things go well for them. It's a hard life. Men today oftentimes are passive. Sometimes men today do not stand up. Sometimes they don't know how to stand up for God. But the Lord's church desperately needs leaders. Judges chapter 5 in verse 2, the Lord's church desperately needs fighters. The Lord's church desperately needs Christians. And so on this day, I want to tell every one of you, happy Father's Day. Respect the fathers that are in your home. Respect the work that they do. Respect the role and responsibility which they have. Respect the people who have gone on before and respect those who are just beginning this whole process of fatherhood. To those who aren't fathers, support those fathers who are in your family. As much as you can, make their work easier. As much as you can, support them in the way in which they should go. Encourage them in their work, in their life, in their actions. I want to tell you, the measure of a man is important. We talked in the beginning of the lesson about the standards which have to be followed. Standards as far as gasoline, standards as far as measurements, standards as far as everything that's out there. But the most important standard to follow is ourself versus the Word of God. Now, each one of us falls short because without Jesus Christ, we're sinners, we're condemned to hell. But as you and I began to conform ourselves and be transformed by the renewing of our mind, we can measure up to be what God has designed for us this day.